<coughs> okay, uh, hi everyone. Thank you for the great announcement. So it's the last presentation of uh, this conference. Uh, I see there's, there's not so many people left, but uh, the strongest one are here. Uh, I actually have a, a, a hidden co-presenter, so he's somewhere in the room, and he was. Uh, so we've designed uh, these slides on uh, Google Drive, and uh, it was on sharing access. And from time to time, my co-presenter was uh, doing some funny things with the slides, and that's why the title was changed as well. And uh, if you. Uh, if you'll be asking me very um, complicated questions, I will ask my co-presenter to help me to answer those. But anyways, uh, this presentation is about Kubernetes and a thing called PCI DSS. And my remote doesn't work. Okay. Show. Yeah. So that's me. I'm from a company called AHATS. Uh, I couldn't find a company to work for, so I've, I'm building my own. And uh, I'm co organizers of events, uh, FrontCon, DevOps, uh, and Riga Dev Days, which you might have heard about. So that's us. That's our project, how we see it. So we are going to a rocket, uh, on a rocket to the moon on Kubernetes engine. Awesome. So the story started uh, some time ago, and uh, one of the customer of ours asked, uh, let, uh, asked us, let's build a new uh, digital payment wallet app, not with Bitcoin, with real money, okay? So yeah, sure, we are a financial technology, DevOps consultancy, let's build one, no problem. <coughs> so of course, we are going to pick uh, the best tool for the job, so Azure wasn't our choice, okay. They told us, use Azure, fine. Uh, but Kubernetes and Terraform was. So we've decided to use it and used it. So now, uh, okay, it's a wallet. Uh, so the concept of an app that you uh, make a photo of your credit card and it's getting stored there. And, and then you can make payments without going through 3D Secure or other complex ways of verifications. Uh, so basically, one-click payments. And, uh, but the problem is that we have to store credit card numbers. And in finance industries, they're called PANs, primary account number. So we are going to store them in this pink database. And we are going to use Kubernetes in public cloud. Uh, and our customer is a bank. Okay, uh, so uh, at, at the beginning it was a little bit uh, scary and uh, nobody really uh, knew what we were doing and uh, if uh, it's going to work at all because there's this problem that uh, credit card systems may be somewhere in the top uh, systems which are getting attacked and if uh, this data is being extracted uh, you have all credit card numbers and you could spend this money somewhere and 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 there will be a lot of problems for our customer uh, and problems could be they could lose their license to operate credit cards for example which is not good so we found out that there is this uh, PCI DSS standard does anyone work with that? Yeah, you don't count. <laughs> uh, so yeah, about five, six people. So basically, it, it, it's, a, it's a written standard around maybe the, the core document is 300 pages or so. And uh, it, it, it provides you with requirements. And there are 12 core requirements, you could read them. So they are pretty simple and comprehensible. And, but, but then they expand to 238 sub-requirements. And, uh, and, and they're a bit longer than that, so you could see some example, examples. But still, you read them and you understand what they want from you. And the, the, the outcome, the end goal, is to have a bunch of auditors come to uh, your place 
uh, do a penetration testing and uh, also manual audit of your system. And you have to give them uh, not only access to your web interface, but they, you have to give them access to an internal network. They will uh, do port scans and uh, any checks they want, as if some insider gives them access to this network and they could do whatever they want from inside. So that's a part of, of, of the deal. And uh, as with all standards, uh, there's a space of uh, interpretation, uh, which means that one requirement could be implemented in different ways. And the options, I would say, are you could uh, write a guideline and, uh, a a and give it to your employees and have dedicated people doing stuff. You could uh, solve some uh, issues and uh, put tick boxes on some requirements only by applying certain architectural and uh, coding practices. And of course, infrastructure and DevOps is very important in PCI DSS scope. So uh, what I mean by space for interpretation, so you could do it in two ways. So you could uh, say have a full-time employee and his uh, duty would be to analyze log files every day, to scroll through them and see if everything is fine, no attacks detected, and so on. And, and some companies do that. Uh, and then this person should uh, uh, have a checklist and say, yeah, I've checked logs, all fine. Or yeah, I found an intrusion alert, let's investigate. And Another way is to automate everything. And this is DevOps conference, we love to automate. So we decided why don't we automate everything because we don't see any full-time people who would be doing this manual stuff anyways. So we've picked cloud, public cloud, <coughs> normal public cloud. And uh, Azure wasn't our choice, but okay. And uh, it turned out that all key cloud providers and uh, providers which are not considered as clouds, but just as um, not so cool data, uh, I mean, some traditional data centers as well, they all have some sort of PCI DSS certification. What, what does it mean? It means that uh, they have uh, taken, uh, uh, they, they have implemented the requirements which are uh, mostly in number nine, restrict physical access to cardholder data. And this uh, section contains rules about video surveillance, about access to chips, about uh, bars and metal cages, and, and so on and so on. And that all the blades and servers related to PCI DSS should be in one room, and all others should be in other room, and there should be a separate cable with foil in order not to allow electromagnetic uh, spies to find out what packets you're sending and so on. Lots of interesting requirements. If you are going for uh, cloud, they are all covered. So Google and uh, Amazon and uh, Microsoft, they're somehow implemented it. We don't know how, but we can just trust them. And all other requirements are either shared or fully on customer shoulders. So shared means that some stuff is given to you by in this case, Azure, but, but if it's customers, then all, all of these requirements should be implemented by us. So that's my favorite. So we've implemented requirement number five for the first one. Uh, so to protect against malware and antivirus software programs, we didn't use Windows. So, and we've ticked a large box. One of 12 requirements is done. However, there's a sub requirement that even if your systems typically don't contain viruses, you have to check regularly if there are virus, if, if maybe viruses have appeared in such system in Linux. And, and, and then uh, write down when did you do it. M make sure that there are no viruses in Linux still. But that's a minor problem. Okay, so uh, the easiest one we've ticked now, number one. Install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. So cardholder data is actually the sensitive card numbers which you wouldn't want to be exposed. I've uh, rephrased uh, the, the requirements in a really short way and it sounds like this. So restrict inbound, outbound, inbound traffic via DMZ, demilitarized zone, 
cardholder date in internal zone. All firewall strategies should be on deny, deny all policy and the employment of uh, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention software. Okay, so uh, when we read all this, so we've had this picture in mind. So we have an uh, attacker, potential attacker from internet. There's a traditional firewall. There's something called intrusion prevention, intrusion detection software residing in DMZ. This guy could talk to on-premise systems because we need that uh, for certain integrations. And uh, in internal network zone, we have our lovely Kubernetes with uh, treasure chest of cardholder data. So does anyone know what IPS IDS is? One, two, three. Nah, not popular. So uh, basically, the first thing we learned about IPS IDS is that Azure doesn't support that. And we require an external tool, <coughs> such as uh, Suricata. And the idea is that uh, that's a network level packet inspection tool, which analyzes packets of supported protocols like HTTP or different uh, other protocols and uh, tell us what to do with this packet. P pass it, drop it, reject, or alert. So that's just an example from documentation uh, saying that we should drop TCP packets going from here to here if something is found out. Also, this uh, tool can uh, trigger alerts, which you would receive as SMS or show them on dashboard or, or somewhere else. and. Uh, it's very optimized and open source. Uh, we are actually using a different tool, a commercial one, but we know for sure that it's possible to implement all the requirements with that open source tool as well. Okay, so we have this uh, a tool which scans all the traffic and uh, your security uh, guy uh, could uh, play with the rules and uh, find what, whatever he wants there. So next is uh, how do we segment our network, right? So we have a bunch of um, Docker images and services inside our Kubernetes cluster. Some of them have access to cardholder data, some of them don't have. But there are certain rules that they all should be hidden, protected by DMZ, and they shouldn't leak any IP addresses, and incoming outgoing traffic should go through our firewall and IPS IDS tool. So th there's a concept of virtual network peering. It's not uh, Azure specific. It's, uh, it's also implemented in AWS and most probably in Google. And the idea is that you, you could have uh, two segments of your network in applications and they are completely independent in a way that uh, part on the left is residing in another cloud account and, and it has different uh, admin users and uh, part on the right has another account with different admin users and you could clearly separate who's responsible for what. And then you <coughs> define so-called VNet peering between two zones. And in this case, you have a connection, connectivity between two uh, networks, networks uh, but the communication goes through private uh, cloud channels. So it doesn't go to internet, it's still inside Azure, <coughs> which means that from security point of view, nothing is being exposed. And it's low latency, right? <coughs> and uh, yeah, so that's virtual network peering. And uh, after that, we found out that the best solution for uh, a PCI DSS certification is so-called hub spoke network topology. Uh, for me, it was something new at this point. That has anyone heard about this? Pattern, okay. So else again, it's not uh, Azure specific. A AWS has uh, similar concepts and documents and diagrams. But the idea is that all traffic coming from internet always going through a network called hub and it has a cluster of firewalls and intrusion detection scanners. And then it uses NAT forwarding to forward traffic to uh, actual uh, 
networks where application resides. And it goes other way around. If application wants to go to internet, it goes through hub. Uh, and, and you uh, configure a VPN connectivity to your on-premise services also in one uh, point. And uh, additionally, what it gives to you is that you could plug in as many independent subscriptions or uh, accounts to one hub. And one hub is administered by your, by your security admins. And then applications do not care about firewalls or IDS, IPS, or VPN. They just communicate via hub with on-premise data center on the internet. And that's, from bank point of view, is uh, exactly what they want. It's very secure, transparent. They get audit logs here. They don't give uh, developers access to the hub. And uh, this, this, it, there's a clean separation of responsibilities. Okay, so we've secured our inbound and outbound traffic. <laughs> now we have our uh, brilliant Kubernetes uh, with uh, pods and uh, ingress egress controllers for incoming and outgoing traffic. And uh, so, and, 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 and in one pod, on one uh, in one Docker container image, uh, one Docker container, we have this card data. And the problem is that, uh, okay, we, we've, we have restricted all these uh, firewall rules, but inside Kubernetes, access is uh, allowed by default from any container to any container. There are no uh, rules by default. So if an attacker uh, hacks at least one pod with some application, out of that, he could reach our credit card database and by having just one key or password steal on all the information. So that's not good. Uh, if, you, if we look into Kubernetes, it's uh, already mature enough that it doesn't only uh, give you a way how to start things in, in a cluster, but also uh, supplies with a lot of security features, for example, network policies. So network policy is an API to define how pods or pod groups communicate with each other. There are different providers, so it's a pluggable API. I think by default they should have something simple, uh, but we've used Calico. It's uh, supported by Azure and other providers as well, natively, sort of. So it comes pre-installed on, on a cluster. And we can use our favorite programming language, YAML. Uh, though I've learned uh, that there was a presentation today saying that it's not a uh, favorite language anymore. <coughs> and, we, and we can define rules that ingress, it's an incoming traffic, so uh, an incoming traffic to credit cards the B DB is only allowed from some sort of application gateway. And by doing that, we are restricting access to our treasure chest only from a certain pod based on labels or some other uh, f filters. And uh, so what we did, we've uh, enabled deny all as default and then uh, implemented all the point-to-point -point access rules from pod to pod to make sure that only uh, allowed uh, communication inside Kubernetes cluster could occur. And so when you first uh, start your uh, Kubernetes cluster, you maybe don't think that it's uh, really necessary. Uh, but uh, <coughs> furthermore, uh, so Kubernetes is a cluster. It has worker nodes. Every worker node has a number of uh, daemon processes, and one of them is kubelet, uh, which uh, is used for Kubernetes master to, to, to uh, automate tasks on this particular node. So what if an attacker could get access to a kubelet uh, API? And uh, as, as I've been told, uh, there already were some vulnerabilities uh, this year, which were fixed, that if someone gets access to this internal Kubelet API, which should never be exposed, an attacker could actually do something with your application. And uh, actually, uh, there's a thing called host policies, 
in uh, Calico, and in the same way as, as you can define um, network policies between pods inside Kubernetes cluster, you could define who could access this uh, internal Kubernetes API. For example, in this case, it's a rule taken from our productive system. Uh, we allow uh, Prometheus metrics collector to connect to uh, a kubelet and retrieve metrics. And attacker wouldn't be allowed. Okay, so that's, that was next level. <coughs> now, we go, we're going even deeper. Uh, what if an attacker manages to put something bad inside the container and uh, deploy it on Kubernetes? In this case, uh, pod policies, host policies will, will not uh, protect us because he actually somehow managed to deploy something into a pod which could get access to our credit card database. Uh, so firstly, th there's such thing as well as a pod security policy uh, which uh, restricts um, malware Docker container from doing a lot of things on a host system. So any container is deployed on a host system, which is a real virtual machine. It has uh, shared files, shared memory, shared networking between many pods with containers. And by applying <coughs> a small YAML, which is called pod security policy, you are restricting your um, pods where you deploy containers to do anything with the host VM they are not supposed to do. And again, it's not uh, uh, given you by default. By default, there's a concept of privileged container which can get access to a Kubernetes API functions. And uh, I'm not sure what is the default, but uh, I, I, I would guess that in Azure, it, th this one is true, which means that you could deploy some evil container which could get access to, 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 to a lot of stuff. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> then we go to DevSecOps topic. So there is a number of checks you should apply and, 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 and some tinkering in order not to allow attacker to deploy uh, evil containers. So firstly, uh, we have uh, a Jenkins job for historical reasons, which uh, builds a Docker image and we apply uh, vulnerability checks on this image. So you, you shouldn't uh, download base images from internet uh, on the fly and then package it and put it into your uh, production system. So instead, you, you already have your base images and all of your deployments residing in your private Azure container registry. Uh, so they have been vulnerability checked. Uh, I will tell how in, in on the next slide. And checksums are recorded. So when you're trying to deploy it, the checksums are checked. If someone has modified uh, it on the disk somehow, then it will fail. And furthermore, uh, Kubernetes has a role-based access rules. Again, by default, if you start your Kubernetes cluster, you, you, you have a root access to Kubernetes cluster. You could deploy, undeploy, and do, do whatever you want. Uh, and uh, this air, air bug uh, rules, uh, they're quite fine-grained, so you could have read, write, delete, update on every uh, type of operation. And one of the best practices, for example, is to have a separate account uh, which can deploy uh, to a Kubernetes cluster. All other accounts, including the accounts which are used by administrators, they cannot deploy to production, so th they have this uh, checkbox is ticked, uh, removed, and uh, so you have to think about how many uh, different uh, uh, access keys you should have and which uh, access mappings uh, do they have in order not to, in, in order to be sure that there's only one account capable of deploying to production and it's not given to anyone without a good reason. About vulnerability check, we actually found a tool called Dagda. Uh, yeah, Latvians will know, but it's not Latvian tool. So it 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 um, it uh, it's, it it could be built into your CI process. It analyzes uh, uh, operating system of your uh, Docker image, it checks all the packages for 
registered vulnerability database, both Linux packages and some SDK packages like Python, Java packages, and also runs some sort of open source antivirus check to, to check for malware and Trojans. And it runs in CI perfectly. So uh, that was requirement number one. We have 11 to go. Uh, so we've restricted inbound outbound traffic. Uh, we're having the separate DMZ where all the communication from and to internet en ends. Uh, our cardholder data is internal zone. Every, all the firewalls and network policies are uh, switched to deny all and then allow one by one strategy. And we are using IDS EPS tool to uh, analyze traffic and to send alerts if something goes wrong. Now we jump to requirement number three, which is quite interesting as well, <coughs> about protecting stored card holder data. So PAN was a credit card number. So we have to encrypt it with strong cryptography, ensure key management process, encrypt encryption keys, uh, secure, securely distribute the keys, rotate the keys, and restrict access to the keys. So complete paranoia. And without that, you are not getting certified. So what is strong cryptography? Uh, in, in our case, uh, so it's a symmetric function. So we could uh, apply it, and uh, our treasure chest turns into a donut. And nobody wants it. But uh, symmetric encryption means that you could have a donut and turn it back into a treasure chest. And s by uh, r strong requirements, AAS is a industry standard, 128 bits minimum, uh, which we used in this case. So what is strong key management? So that's more interesting. So it, it, it's, it's not enough to have a password. It's not enough to have an encryption key. What, what has to be done by the book is that you have to have at least uh, two key parts which are turned into a master key by a certain mathematical algorithm. There's an algorithm to turn a chunk of keys into a master key. And uh, for example, you could have eight keys distributed and to recreate a master key, you should have only four out of eight, whatever, which ones. And there's this master key in finance called key encryption key, CAC, and it's used to encrypt data encryption key deck and data encryption key in turn is used in order to turn treasure chests into donut and all of the keys uh, should be rotated from time to time so that's how it should work in in in, in uh, if you want to store uh, credit card systems and auditor don't really care how you do it in software hardware whatever so we've used a hashicorp vault which i'm sh pretty sure you've heard about so it's an open source encryption as a service tool. Uh, so we've managed to keep it open source and not to go for enterprise license. So that's for some rare cases. And <coughs> it provides you with uh, public key infrastructure. You'll be able to generate key pairs and uh, manage them from user interface and revoke and so, so on. It gives us key value store, which we used to store credit card data time-based tokens, so the ones uh, uh, like Google Authenticator uses the uh, same algorithm as, as Vault gives to you. So if you want to build your own Google Authenticator functionality, so this, this guy can, can, can uh, give it to you securely, and some other functionality. And it provides strong key management and encryption. Uh, so it has, a, it has two operations. Uh, rekey and rotate. So, so basically, when uh, when uh, Vault is operational, it, it has this uh, master key, which is used in order to encrypt data encryption keys as per requirements. And furthermore, it's possible to invoke a rekey operation and from one master key to generate another master key, and they would be kind of related in a keychain and. Uh, it is possible that in, in a database you have old records encrypted with old key and new records would be encrypted with new key. But then when you call rotate, all, all old records are 
now encrypted with a new key. So it's like a maintenance function. And both of these functions would be needed to be called by a scheduled job from time to time in order to comply with requirements. I'm not sure what was the uh, period of uh, rotation, two weeks, three months, I don't remember, some period. Okay, next. Uh, so we download Vault, we started, okay? And uh, it's, it's in so-called sealed state. Sealed state means it's not functional. It doesn't know how to encrypt and how to decrypt. And in order to uh, unseal it by their terminology, we have to provide these key shares, uh, which compose into one master key. And furthermore, we have a vault in a cluster. And vault itself, it doesn't have any persistence. So uh, it works on a lot of... Um, uh, databases on top of a lot of databases, for example, on, on top of PostgreSQL. So you could have a vault cluster and all the data is encrypted in Postgres. And if attacker downloads a database from Postgres, it's useless because it doesn't contain any keys and uh, it's all encrypted. So th there's no issue if your database gets downloaded somewhere. Uh, yeah, and if you supply all the shares, uh, Vault in memory uh, clicks to unsealed mode and start being operational, encrypting, decrypting, and all other functionality. So there's one problem with manual unseal. So every time you restart a cluster, someone has to use a UI or uh, a client in order to, to give this uh, sh portions of keys. And un uh, unless you do it, 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 it doesn't work. And key shares should be protected at all uh, as well. And uh, by PCI DSS requirements, there should be at, at least two uh, key, key custodians. So there has to be two real person, uh, and each of them is <coughs> having a, a portion of the key. <coughs> and since one of them could uh, be sick or, or, or fired or something, it's better to have a, a bit more uh, key portions in, in organizations. <coughs> and then if your cluster restarts, you have to run and find these guys and, and girls so they input these key portions so Vault is uh, operational. So that's a problem. And uh, it, it's possible to automate it as well. There's uh, auto unseal functionality in Vault and uh, it requires one more element of the puzzle. In our case, Azure Key Vault. So Azure Key Vault is a cloud solution which generates keys, securely stores them, allows access to them for uh, Azure portal users and CLI users, and provides uh, usage monitoring. So it actually logs when someone downloads a, a key. And you could also revoke them automatically. And it ended up like this. So we have an Azure Key Vault where we have given access to only trusted administrators. It generated key portions. We have uh, a library, we're using a library called Bank Vaults, which is open source. It, it is able to retrieve these key portions, uh, feed it to Vault cluster, and by doing that, it starts working. And if it, starts, if it started working, then we could ask uh, <coughs> Vault, uh, give me an actual credit card number for this identificator. Uh, unle unless it's not working, well, w when it's not working, we so all of our credit card numbers are encrypted somehow, nobody knows how, and you cannot access them. And then it's uh, out fully automatic, and uh, it, it, it's starting itself. So that's how we've uh, checked all the boxes of requirement number three. So, how many? Yeah, nine more to go. But actually, no. Uh, so we, we're we're wrapping up here. Uh, so big news. Uh, I've been allowed to share uh, the name of the project we worked at, uh, in. It's called uh, Clicks Up, and so it's a local solution. And the website was launched yesterday. 
And uh, so now it's in a so-called silent beta testing mode, but I guess in a month or so, it would be possible to start uh, making uh, real purchases. Uh, yeah, if you're interested, you could come to me and I'll, I'll explain what it is, but basically it's how you do uh, payments, shipments, and, and some other interesting stuff online from an app without a need to go through uh, 3D secure verification procedure of your bank. So there will be a pin code like in Smart ID and similar solutions. Yeah, so uh, a summary. There's a lot of security features in Docker, Kubernetes, and Cloud. Uh, we've uh, learned quite a lot about it and uh, so it's it's a completely different uh, mindset when you start thinking about those so actually no one in uh, even organization such a bank is uh, against kubernetes and cloud for even such um, mission critical and uh, security intense project uh, auditors are fine as well and standards actually, they force you to do all the best practices from the day one, because if there wouldn't be any standard, I'm pretty sure we would be hacked uh, after the launch. And DevOps uh, actually, and DevOps tooling helped a lot, because all, all of the requirements, except guidelines and some uh, procedures we had to write in, in, in Word file, all the operational and uh, architecture and deployment stuff, everything is 100% automated. And we managed to find uh, all the solutions to tick all the boxes. And uh, sometimes we used preview features of Azure, but uh, suddenly they, they, they came out, out of preview and became uh, stable sort of. And uh, so it all works. So we just need to launch it in a month or so. And that's it for my presentation. I, uh, Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got a couple of questions. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dimitri, ready? Yeah. First one. How cloud providers guarantee the hardware attacks not happen like the Meltdown, Spectre, etc.? Uh, that one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that one. As they, as they keep changing, right? It's yeah, yeah, probably something uh, just happened uh, and I haven't refreshed it yet. So, yep. But yeah, let's go with this one. It's pretty viral. Uh, okay, let's... Okay, how... Uh, how we need to clarify this. Who, who wrote the question? Please. Okay, can you help us out with it? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they guarantee. We don't know how, and maybe <laughs> they don't do it, but uh, it's a question of liability whose fault it is. So uh, in, in, in PCI DSS specif uh, certification specifically, if Azure get hacked, it's not our problem, it's not our financial losses, it's their financial losses. But we don't know, and maybe it's possible to hack Azure from inside, but nobody knows and nobody tells us. So the only information that we requested from Azure is uh, algorithms of data encryption. So we've written to support and they've answered these are the algorithms we use to encrypt data blah 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 but how they maintain uh, memory uh, so nobody else could access we don't know thank you okay the most viral one now yeah so how often credit card gets attacked uh, so I've read somewhere that credit card systems are the really top maybe top three to get attacked and uh, what attack vectors are most often used? I don't know. I didn't do this research. The problem is that with PCI DSS, you have to be protected from all possible vectors from day one. 
and that's why we are not uh, we are not uh, interested in analysis how to gradually protect ourselves like okay so we uh, defend ourselves from this vector and then this and then that so we we have to do everything at once and it's a big project thank you uh, maybe one more last one uh, how have uh, you come yeah. up with this solution yes uh, uh, th 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 there's no uh, one place where you could read about this solution. So we watched, uh, so there are maybe five, six presentation available online about PCI DSS and Kubernetes at this moment, uh, which speak about different parts of architecture. And uh, there are also different approaches uh, of your network isolation of tools you use. So, so basically we've picked uh, a, a lot of uh, documented and available solution in open source market and, and, and in some articles, conferences, and put it together. So, so it was uh, a quite uh, quite a challenge because if you would ask me six months ago how how, how it would all work, I wouldn't be able to answer it to you. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's it. Make some noise, Dmitry Gostev. Yeah.